Welcome to Asia Pacific Business Strategies, coming to you from the ThinkTech studios in downtown Honolulu. At the controls today is Jay Fidel, the executive producer at ThinkTech. I'm the host, Michael North, speaking from the office of Asia Pacific Group in Beijing. Our guest is Christopher Theodore, the editor and publisher of The Reader, an innovative magazine from the San Bernardino area, California. The Reader reaches nearly 400,000 households without charge across a region known as the Inland Empire, with Palm Springs to the east, San Diego to the south, and Los Angeles to the west. Chris has big plans to take The Reader National across America, and we'll get a hint of those plans today. There was a challenge getting the connection fired up between Hawaii, California, and China today, so we pick up the discussion in progress now. Magazines are closing down, too, and all journalists are looking for jobs, and they're all going to the electronic media, their start blogs, and so on. And the, the conventional wisdom is there's no real business model, with the exception of some franchises like the Washington Post and the New York Times and so on. There's no market for, for print. So what, what I'm interested in hearing from you is, why is your particular niche, your particular style, um, enduring and thriving in this time when, as a whole, the print publishing industry is definitely shrinking and moving across to electronic media? Well, I think that one of the most important things that I could uh, share with your viewers today is that oftentimes there is truth in, in conventional thinking. And, but also, oftentimes, the, our, in, our, in our generalizations, other truth gets lost. And so while there is shift to digital, some of the very important um, truths, and not just important, but significant from a market perspective, are there too that do not get um, told in this narrative. So amongst the big narrative that we hear about the shift to digital, a lot of times we miss things such as this, that college students, um, this was, it was reported in the New York Times, are showing a, 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 a preference in their books for print rather than digital. So it isn't just um, people like myself um, in middle age um, who are interested in print, it's the young people as well. So, that, so, so that's an interesting aspect of, um, of it from a kind of a, a, a ground level perspective. But when you look at it from a top level perspective and look at the data about how much money is being spent on print in the local advertising market last year, it was half of all local advertising dollars, or $70 billion out of the $140 billion was spent on print. That was more than spent on digital. So, um, so that is some of, you know, that is the, the underpinnings of why it makes sense to, to still operate in print. But it's not as if we are not interested and not developing and not offering now uh, digital and mobile solutions as well. We are. But where what we are doing is we can go into a new market and provide something that local advertisers understand, want to spend money on, and do spend money on, which is print, and at the same time enable those advertisers to have a connection with all of the good people in the community. And that's something that no digital platform can do. Chris, what is the circulation now? of the magazine based in Redlands, California. Yes, it is 390,000 people um, who receive the reader. Pretty much um, 70 to 90 percent of all people in the nine cities that we um, operate in receive our publication. So if you were a, a, a business person that is, was living in these communities, you can imagine that's a pretty cool thing to be able to have, a connection with a guaranteed, um, as you have said, uh, Michael, a guaranteed connection. Um, so we're talking a lot about you know the, the market side and why it makes sense as a business, but a really crucial aspect of of how do you how do you guarantee how do you guarantee that 
those 390,000 people are going to see the reader? How can you guarantee that to advertisers? Well, we spend a lot of money with the United States Post Office to guarantee that. And um, oh. thankfully, the, the U.S. Post Office, which has been in operation before the founding of the United States in, in the 17th century, over 300 years, has developed one of the most uncelebrated and underappreciated information technology distribution networks humanity has ever put together. You know, and that is something that we are able to leverage, and then we are able to go into these communities. And with the magic of time, we are able to develop a relationship, a journalistic relationship, and really present great content that, that um, these, these communities might not be getting elsewhere. So that infrastructure, which dates literally from the person buggy area, era has now been updated, is now being used in the information superhighway, if you like. And I guess they, they maintain a pretty clean list of all the residential and business addresses right. in your market area. So you can know by documented fact that the reader, which is a glossy magazine, it's not just a, a newsprint rag, it's a beautiful looking magazine. And we'll see some samples in a moment. You can guarantee that every single person and every single business is going to receive that. So if I'm a local restaurant or if I'm a car wash or if I'm a beautician, I can know that everybody's going to get my message. Whereas with, for example, Google I can or Facebook, I can do all the targeting I want to do. But I'm never going to be able to guarantee the volume and the saturation that the reader can in your local market. Am I, is that a That's correct right. summary? Uh, yeah, it's a fair summary. And I think a fair metaphor, Michael, is uh, in terms of our business strategy in which we are delivering a physical media product and then encouraging users to migrate to a purely digital relationship is Netflix. Because Netflix actually leveraged the United States Post Office, and probably all of us are familiar with that because we used to receive the red CDs. And that was a physical media product. And just like the reader does, we yeah. leverage the U.S. Post Office, and then we are migrating users to a purely digital relationship. So as time moves on, we will be able to um, go with the flow of, of, of case while still holding on to um, our print publication for the same reason Jeff Bezos of Amazon loves his Washington Post, because it is a fundamental part of so many people's lives to have something that doesn't need a battery or a plug, um, and you can just have. It's something physical. And there's something about, can you comment on the, the physical medium of the glossy cover reader as opposed to the ephemeral connection of a link or a pop-up that you see on your on your phone. You know what, Michael? I I I I, I could um, comment on on that, but I bet all of our all of everyone hearing my voice understands that. You know, I think it's very human to be excited about the next new thing, but there's a reason why. Paper is a 2,200-year-old information technology, um, 2,000 years older than the word sustainable. Um, that has roots, and I think the physicality of paper is something I actually get more out of when I'm learning and reading. Uh, you know, whether I was in print or not, I know I, if I took a lie detector test, it would be the same answer, that I, I, I tend to get more out of uh, of print. Well, also, you may keep that magazine sitting on the coffee table or in the bathroom or in the kitchen. You know, that may be there for two or three months, right? Whereas the, the ad that comes through on your screen may be there for two or three seconds. So it's a, it's a yeah. different kind of impression that it's made. And, and I think a super important point to make is that it's not necessary to say, hey, one is better than the other. What we're really glad about is that so many people have 
underappreciated the power of print, and everybody's focusing on digital, we're focusing on digital too. We're developing great digital products too, but we're also understanding that our business is a great business because it has something that these digital um, products don't have. It has a guarantee to get within a community and mean something to that community. So they, they can dovetail together. They can work. They can synergize. That's and they should, yeah, and they do. Um, in the control room there in Honolulu, can you bring up the, the first screen, the, the zero, zero screen? And uh, Chris can uh, comment on that. This is a screen capture from, uh, that I sent to you uh, yesterday. That it's a, is it a title that says, The Reader Magazine, Creating an Awakened and Engaged Inland Empire an environmentally responsible oh, sure. revolution. Yeah. Give us a little narrative happy on to. what that means. Sure, happy to, Michael. So one of the aspects that's pretty uh, exciting and cool about um, the reader is its environmental impact. Um, in the United States, every year, 96 billion pieces of direct mail are sent. 42% of those never get opened. Um, the result of that is that it's a further um, impetus for there to be an environmentally responsible solution to all of the direct mail that everyone in the studio, everyone here in Mammoth Lakes gets every day. And so the, what the reader does, Michael, is by, by having a journalistic model rather than a high frequency, low quality model, the reader has been um, seem to be uh, kept 80%, which is almost double the rate of normal direct mail. So we can all imagine the impact on the environment if 42 million trees annually are being destroyed every year in the United States for mail that never gets opened. So that is why we mentioned uh, the port of environment. You're a quarterly magazine, is that correct, Chris? Yes, it is a quarterly uh, publication. Okay, Michael, so we'll uh, Michael, we're about the, through the halfway. Um, uh, that's Michael okay. North. He's our host of Asia Pacific Business Strategies, and uh, his guest is Chris Theodore, co-founder of Noble Media, which is the publisher of The Reader. And we're talking about The Reader as an example of print press that still works and thrives. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back to continue this discussion. Okay, we're back, we're live. Uh, this is Asia Pacific Business Strategies. Our host is Michael North. Uh, he joins us by Skype from Beijing. And his guest is uh, Chris Theodore, who's the co-founder of Noble Media, which is a publisher of Reader, Reader Magazine. And they've been talking about that. So back to you, Michael, for more. Thank you, Jay. Uh, in the control room, can we bring up the, uh, the graphic that says zero one? It has a bunch of covers of the reader, and these, this is just a few of the covers of the quarterly magazine over the past several years. There's a great diversity of topics that's covered by the reader, and it's, this is not just generic journalism. This is high-quality original journalism that has a socially conscious and environmentally sensitive pitch to it. Chris, can you comment on 
why you're doing that, other than the fact that it's an area that's of interest to you, there has to be a business reason why you've chosen this particular theme for the Reader Magazine. <clears throat> well, I would say this, Michael. Um, you've probably heard that fantastic quote that says, do what makes you come alive, because the world is hungry for people who are doing what makes them come alive. Um, and I think that your life represents that, in, in my opinion. And um, in a similar way, when you create content, um, any, any good filmmaker will tell you that the best films that they've ever made mean something. You know, it's about stories that they had to tell. And for me, um, so I, I have an understanding that when you talk, when you make media like that, that, that people can tell you care a great deal about, while everyone may not agree with the perspective or even maybe the choice that you've, you've made in order to center um, your issue on, let's say, climate change or the abolition of nuclear weapons or um, anything that really questions the underlying issues of society, um, I think that is something that is in great need today. So from a personal perspective, there is an alignment. It dovetails into what is needed in the market as well. Um, I would say media is really kind of dead. Um, there's too many filters from the editorial um, uh, structures you know by the time it gets to normal people it's been so filtered out of the life and the juice that it doesn't really mean something to the audience so advertisers are drawn to audiences and audiences are drawn to to truth and passion right. and, and and the information that isn't being talked about can we look at the next screen because i think it exemplifies what you're talking about Chris, we're now looking at a, a screen that's, that, that has a headline, Scientist Daniel Swain on Unprecedented Climate Conditions Contributing to Deadly California Wildfires. This is uh, on the website right now, and I presume coming right. to a print edition. Um, this is an example of, of, of a current issue that you're taking on in your community, right? Yes. And what's really interesting, Michael, to me is that if you'll notice in many of the mainstream media outlets, they will talk about the wildfires, but there has, been, and even scientists that are brought onto the show um, have been in some ways told not to, to bring up climate change. So there's a real, there's a real disconnect, you know, between the, the structures of a lot of mainstream um, media, or we can call them media establishment, and, the, and, the, and people, as well as reality. So it's a really interesting time to be in media because there's a, a moral opportunity that dovetails with a market opportunity. Um, how many times in American history has there been an opportunity in which you can tell the truth and have, and, and on some really profound issues, and um, and find a market. Uh, opportunity by doing so. So your area around Redlands and San Bernardino and so on is a it's a kind of a red area, kind of a blue area. It's sort of shifting back and forth. It's, it's kind of purple right. these days. Do you get uh, pushback from your readers and say, "Don't cover all these uh, radical ideas. We're, we're not interested." Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we do, but I would much rather have that pushback, Michael, than um, than not. You know, and, um, so. But we also get letters um, telling us, "Thank you, um, thank you for being what you are in this community," and um, right. so that's worth it to me to get the pushback from some. Um, we've been, uh, we've we've had some. Uh, um, repercussions, negative repercussions from a market standpoint um, as a result of our content. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it balances out. And on, in, on the long-term basis, it, it would be much better, and we believe and uh, it is much better to have a voice because people still hun are hungering for that. 
Okay, let's go in the control room there. Can we go to the next graphic, which is the number 03? And we're looking at another story here, Chris. U.S. wealth inequality is extreme, and Republican tax plans would make it worse. So this is, I chose this because I wanted to emphasize that you do sometimes take uh, partisan political positions, but you're not necessarily Democrat or Republican. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I, I would say that most, um, most Americans are, are, um, have a lot of anxiety over the dysfunction of both political parties. And what we're interested in doing is raising the, the quality of the conversation and um, making sure that communities as, uh, and people and families can, can have a high level of political consciousness and a, and, a, and, a, and a higher level of being able to debate with each other. I know that some time ago when it was really front page news, you took on the issue of Syrian refugees on your cover and it was very interesting that you would take on an international uh, issue like that and highlight it. Can you talk to us about why you did that and what the stories were that you were telling? I, I, yeah, thanks. I'm so glad you mentioned that issue, Michael, because that is one of the issues that I'm proudest of that we had something uh, to do with. And it came together really in a really fantastic way. I was in New York at the time <clears throat> at the um, Fast Company Festival, uh, and I made contact with a uh, Dutch couple who had visited um, refugee camps in Lebanon and was allowing these people to, to tell their stories. And I, and I thought it, and, and it was really, really powerful, her imagery. She, she had photographed um, for Vogue, for the New Yorker magazine. And I, and I, I want to tell something that's very, very important, that this story and her participation actually illustrates, Michael. And that is that she, being this very high-priced photographer, gave our company the right to publish these fantastic photographs because she had promised these people that she would tell their story. And so the Reader Magazine, this local media channel in California, was able to have world-class photographs of these people because we were interested in telling their story, and so was she. So, so that... Um, what we were interested in doing essentially was letting them speak and not getting in the way between our community as well and these people who were marginalized and oppressed. And uh, we want to champion people like that. Because to be honest with you, I think more and more Americans feel that they are on the sidelines, that they are not really being yeah. um, considered. And so what, as they see us, um, championing the oppressed, a part of them, I believe, sees, well, I'm glad that there is a publication that is taking um, up the cause and championing those people who, who need a voice. Right. Now, in the control room, can we advance to uh, the, the slide that is Reader 05? Chris, what we're looking at here is a, is a two-page spread of the inside of a current issue of the magazine. I wanted people just to have a, a sense of how local is local and what does local mean. So one of the ads here uh, is for uh, $5 off. It looks like an art supply store. Another one is for uh, the All Red Children Development Program call for enrollment. Um, another ad is uh, is uh, Mountain Vista Optical, the Inland Empire's premier optical choice. So yeah. these are local businesses, not necessarily national brands, although they could be associated right. with national brands. And this is your constituency. These are yeah. the people and the businesses that are actually voting for you with their feet and with their wallets to say they trust you with their message to reach their people. Can you, can you just right. comment on, say, one or two of those advertisers and, and somebody who's been with you for years and 
and intends to continue to stay with you because they know that you're doing the job and they also believe in the message. Yeah, thanks, Michael. I'm really glad you brought them up because without advertisers, um, there is no Reader Magazine. And I think, I think um, so one of them that you brought up was Mountain Vista Optical. Um, and uh, my wife, Sharon, is actually, um, as she's an eye surgeon, and she has helped uh, Ryan, who owns that company, with his, some of his eye problems that he's had. But um, what, I, what I think is the, the, the coolest thing about bringing small businesses up is that, um, you know, this is the stuff of, of life. You know, $5 off on, um, on something, you know, and, and this is, and, and small businesses together across the United States, all 28 million of them are a force. You know, they are a political, they are a social, cultural force. Most Americans are either employees or connected um, family members of small businesses. So when you think of what the reader is, the word you used was constituency. I couldn't, I couldn't imagine a better constituency to have than the, the 28 million um, potential small businesses as, as potential customers who who contribute a third of the entire 30 trillion um, GDP of the United States. And so these small businesses like Ryan's need good advertising. And I would add one more thing, if I may. And that is one of the crucial aspects of the, the, the reader's model, Michael, in terms of what keeps us honest, is the fact that we are accountable to the Ryan of Mount Vistas of the world. If he doesn't like what we are publishing, he can stop advertising and have an effect, an immediate effect on the content. Can compare that to him stopping as a subscriber to Comcast cable television. It doesn't matter. But on a local business, this accountability is a very, very crucial aspect of what keeps the reader honest and a potential force for a lot of good in the United States. Well, Michael, we're going to have to leave it there. We're just about out of time. Thank you so much, Michael North and Chris Theodore. Chris is the co-founder of Noble Media. Uh, the publisher of The Reader. We've heard a lot about it, it's a, and it's a stirring story, a remarkable conversation. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you yeah. so much, Chris. Aloha until Thank next you. time. Aloha. 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 Mahalo.